we've already talked about. There's stochastic gradient descent. There's SGD with momentum. Spoke about the Nestrov method. Uh, then there are other methods as well. I'm not going to go over the details right now, but maybe uh, at an appropriate time, we'll, start, we'll talk about this. There's something called ADA grad. Uh, there's something called RMS prop. And this one is quite popular, Adam, which is a combination of uh, these two, RMS prop and momentum, okay? And I'm not going to talk about these details right now. Maybe we'll, we'll go over these at an appropriate time. So uh, let's start with our new topic, which is uh, convolutional neural networks, okay? Um, so uh, a lot of the hype about deep neural networks actually based on image recognition, all right? Some of the examples that we earlier saw where you, you, you saw images, especially on Google Photos and so on, where images being recognized, a lot of it is based on uh, the convolutional neural network, which basically addresses the issue of image recognition. Um, now, image recognition, uh, one of the concepts uh, that is part of the, uh, the, the CNN algorithm is the term called convolution. Okay, so convolutional neural networks. So first of all, let's try to understand what does convolution mean. Okay, now if anybody has, uh, if there are any people who are in electrical engineering or have had a doubly kind of a background, uh, for them, uh, convolution is a little bit more complex. And typically it involves two vectors and you have to flip one around and then pass it around. So uh, that's a little bit more complex, but that's the original idea behind convolution, okay? As far as image recognition is concerned, it's a little simpler. And all you have to do is understand what a filter is, okay? So let's take an example. And um, I'm going to show you uh, some filters and we're going to try to understand how these filters work, okay? I hope everybody online uh, is able to see the screen. Yes, so, uh, so let's assume that you have an image, okay? Here's an image I'm call, referring to as image one. Let's say it can, it's a three by three image with, uh, three by, with, uh, with single elements and each one of these pixels has a value of either one or zero, okay? And this is sort of an image which has a, a diagonal uh, along it, okay? So you can see that it's basically an image which has a diagonal line in it, okay? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to see um, if we apply a particular filter uh, and we apply convolution on it, uh, what would the result be, okay? So I'm going to take a filter so this is now a two by two filter, okay? So the basic idea here is that you have an input. Here's the image, which is the input. You have a filter, okay? Here's a filter, which I'm going to look at two filters, F1 and F2. So the first filter I've, I've given you as one, zero, zero, one, okay? So notice that this filter is, uh, has values along the diagonal. Off diagonal, the values are zero, okay? And now we're going to apply convolution to this, okay? So convolution basically, uh, as far as image recognition is concerned, is fairly straightforward. What it says is that take the filter and generally the filter is smaller than the original image, okay? You take the filter and you apply it to the starting with, with you know, let's say the top left corner of the image, okay? So you simply place the, the filter on top of this and you do um, a dot by, uh, a point by point multiplication and you do an addition, and then you take the average. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward. So if we do that, what do we get over here? Uh, we get one times one. Okay, so I'll just do it over here. One times one plus, then we multiply zero with zero, that's a zero. Then we're going to multiply a zero with a zero over here, again, another zero. And then we're going to multiply a one over here with a one over here. Okay, so the answer is a two. And then we take the average, let's say it has uh, filters, there are four points, so it gets an average of 0 0.5, okay? Now we're going to apply the same filter and we're going to shift it by one slot, okay? So now the filter is going to be somewhere over here. Now can somebody tell me what the value is going to be over here? It's going to be 
the majority says zero, so it's probably the zero, zero right? So that's a zero because, you know, um, in fact, three of these points are already zero. The one which is non-zero has to be multiplied with a zero, so the output is zero, okay? Similarly, we're going to now apply it over here. We put the filter over here. And what's the result over here? Again, a zero. Um, and now we apply it to the final quadrant over here. And what do we get? 0 0.5, okay? So you can see that uh, the, this image was originally a, a diagonal and by picking a filter, which was also a diagonal, we've been able to get an output, which is also uh, diagonally based, okay? And the off diagonal values are zero. So this sort of gives you some idea what the filter is actually doing, okay? So this filter is basically picking up trying to pick up um, a diagonal based image, okay? Now let's see if we want to pick, if we, if we try to pick an image which was not a diagonal, which was something like this, okay? Which had ones over here. So what kind of filter would you want to pick? Clearly we would want to pick perhaps a filter which looked like zero, uh, so a zero over here, one, one, and a zero, okay? So this is now uh, a diagonal in the opposite direction. So hopefully if we apply this to an image which is um, a diagonal on the other side, it should be able to pick similar values over here which would again give a result which is somewhat uh, dominant over here, okay? But let's see what happens when we apply to this particular image, image one, okay? What would happen if we apply uh, filter two to image one? What would be the values over here? Zero. Um, so a uh, point, let's say point one time, so this one would be multiplied by this one over here, and you would divide it by four, so you get 0.25, okay? Sorry, where did, where did I go? Uh, you apply it over here, it gets 0.25 over here, um, and this is wrong. We apply it over here, again, it's going to be 0.25, so I erase that too early, and we apply it on this particular quadrant, it will be zero, okay? So you can see that uh, even though we applied it to this particular image, it uh, the values um, on the diagonal came out to be zero, okay? But there were some values which are off diagonal, okay? So, um, so we don't really know what's going on. It's, it's hard to figure out what's really happening, okay? But let's take a look at if we applied uh, now to this particular image, which I said was diagonal, leaning to the other side. Okay, so now we have image two, and we're going to apply the same filters, filter one and filter two, to this particular image. Okay, so what do you think is going to uh, happen over here? 0 0.25, zero, zero, 0.25, Okay, and we apply it over here. That's a zero. Point five. Point five and zero. Okay, so you can see that um, the previous image, the previous this particular filter, was able to pick up this image by having leading point fives in the diagonal. Okay. But when it was applied, um, but uh, when a different filter was applied, it didn't really do much, okay? But when we applied uh, this filter with the dominant ones over here, it was able to pick up this particular diagonal, okay? And just like in the previous case, the off diagonal values were zero, okay? So the off diagonal values were zero as well over here, okay? So you get an idea what the filter is doing. 
the filter is somehow, depending on the nature of the filter, it's able to pick up certain features in the original uh, image. So depending on the filter, it's going to pick up an appropriate feature, okay? So the feature that this particular image is picking up is what? It's trying to pick up a feature which we can say is a left-leaning diagonal line, okay? This particular filter is a filter designed to pick up a certain feature. And what is that feature? It's not this feature because over here it doesn't give you very high values. It gives you 0.25 values. It's not as high as 0.5. But um, when it's applied to an image which has a diagonal line, it is able to pick up this particular feature and you can see the result by having large values over here, okay? And when this Sir? the same, and when the, this, uh, the, the left leaning filter is applied to this, it doesn't get very strong values, okay? So that's the basic idea behind filters, G. Okay, not, not necessarily, okay? Uh, generally, if you apply a filter, um, it will be about the same size, okay? But it depends on several factors. So I'm glad you raised this point. Let's figure out what is the size of the, of the subsequent filter. Let's say that this is of size W1, okay? And the image is of size F1. Okay, uh, what do you think is the output going to be equal to? Can you write an equation for this? It's a little tricky, but uh, think of, a, of another image. So let's take an example. Um, so let's take an example of an image uh, which is a little bigger. Um, anyway, I'll just use this over here. So let's say the image size, um, let's try it over here. So let's say the image size is is let's say uh, four by four, okay? And you're applying um, a two by two filter on it. So, um, so how big do you think is this going to be? So you apply it over here, all right? Now there's something called a, a sliding factor. So it depends on how much you're sliding. So let's say the slide you're sliding by S is equal to one. In other words, the first, the first time you put the filter, you put it over here, okay? The second time you, you put the filter, you put it over here, okay? You basically slide it by one. And then the third time you put it, you slide it by one again, you put it over here, okay? And then you go all the way till the end, let's say, you go uh, till the end over here, okay? So how, um, how, how big do you think the output is going to be? One, two, and three. So it's going to be the same, okay? So it's going to be an image which is, well, sorry, uh, it depends. So it depends if I, if I use this, uh, let's say I started over here, then I went over here, then I went over here, and I went over here. So you can see that the image is a four by four. Is that right? So you, you put the left, the, let's say you put this particular point over here, one, then you shift it by one, two, then you shift it by one, three, and let's assume that you go a little bit aboard, overboard, okay? Now in practice, what happens is that you have something called padding. Okay, so let's talk about that. So what you do is you take the original image, okay, and you put padding around it. And the purpose of padding is exactly to figure out where you're going to start and where you're going to finish, okay? 
So let's say that the padding is of length P. Okay. This image is of length W1, and this is a square image. Okay. The filter is of size F1. So let's, uh, let's take this particular example again. So uh, we take a padding of one. So we pad this image over here. And now the image beca becomes a little bit bigger. Uh, we start by putting the image. So let me take another example. It's getting a little crowded. So let's say you have this image. The original image was, let's say, four by four. After padding of one on both sides, what's the size going to be? Uh, six by six. Okay, so W1 was four. And now the image is W1 plus 2P. Okay, so let's say this is the, the width of this is, is padding is P. Okay, you're applying a filter of size F. So uh, can we guess? what would be the size of the output? So if you have a six by six image, okay, you start over here, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, and it depends on where you end. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, if you're ending over here, so you've got a one, two, three, four, five, an output of five. Now let me tell you what the equation is. The equation is W1 plus two P um, minus one divided by S. Now uh, here the sliding size is is one. Okay, sorry, not. So this is the actual equation. Oh no, we will be, so you do apply padding. So when you do real world convolution networks on a real image, you apply padding, okay? And the reason is that if you don't apply padding, that you won't actually get an appropriate, you, you're actually missing out on some of the corners. So in other words, for example, if you started off over here, uh, if, if this was your original image and you didn't apply padding, so you would start off over here, right? But if you applied padding, you would start off over here. So you, were, you wouldn't miss out on this particular corner, okay? So it actually does a better job of covering the entire image by having some padding at the, at the edges, you're able to do a convolution over the entire network, over the entire image. Okay. Otherwise, you actually lose some of the edges. Okay. The filter size is variable. So let's say that the filter size is F over here. So let's see if this is if this works out. Okay, if this equation is correct. Um, so if you had an original image of four by four, and you had a padding of size one. Then, um, and you have a uh, filter of size two, okay? So what does this number come out to be? And your stride is of, 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 of size one. This is the stride, this is of size one. In other words, you're shifting one every time, okay? So um, what did we guess? We'd have start here, one, two, three, four, five. So the output should be five by five. Is that right? W1 is four plus two, that's six minus two, that's four divided by two, two plus one. So it should be a three by three. Sorry, the sliding is one. So it's five. Did everybody follow that? Okay. Yes, yes. So so now let's take a look, look at an example where you actually have a sliding size of two, okay? So now what you're doing is you have an image, okay? And let's say every time you move it, you move it by two fact, by, by S is equal to two, a stride of two. So again, the image size is six, and we have a filter of four, okay? 
So you would start off one over here. You'd put the, the original image over here, a two by two image. So this is an example where W1 is equal to four, which is the original image size, uh, padding of one, okay? Um, the filter size is a two by two filter, and we're going to use a stride of two. Okay, in other words, when we're going to put the original filter, the next filter that we're going to shift it by, we're going to put it over here. And the third time we're going to shift it, we're going to shift it by a stride of two, okay? So how many uh, images are, uh, how, what is the output size going to be? It's, it should be a three by three, okay? Let's say if the, does the equation predict us correctly? It says that's going to be W1 plus two P minus F divided by S plus one. S one is just an offset. And so you have a four plus two, six minus two, which is a four divided by two plus a one. So that comes out to be three, okay? So you can see that this particular equation tells you what the size is going to be. And your question was, okay, does the um, output, is it going to be smaller or not? So is the output going to be smaller? What does it depend on? Does it depend on the it does it depend on the filter? It does. So if the if the if the filter is really big, it's going to have some impact. It's uh, it's going to have an impact exactly by this. But what's going to have a bigger impact? The stride. So if you're taking big strides, if you're taking a stride of three, essentially your image will become one third in size. Okay. But your filter is going to have a nominal impact. Uh, you know, if, if let's say your image is a thousand and your um, filter is a hundred, so you expect that it will become maybe 900, okay? Slightly smaller by, by the same amount, okay? But if your stride is, let's say two, then the, instead of a thousand by thousand, it'll become something like 500 by 500, okay? Uh, so normally you don't take a stride of more than one, you take a stride of one, but it depends. There are lots of algorithms and each one of them have their own techniques. Sorry? Huh, length of weight different, okay, you use the same equation. So you use height, okay? So the height of the image will be given by the height of the output. This is the output, okay? And this is the input image. So you take the height, a WH1 plus the padding minus the filter size. Now filter sizes are normally uh, symmetric. So if it's a three by three, it's going to be, you know, if it's F F by F, it's not going to be F by two F or something like that. Most, most filters are symmetric, okay? Uh, so, and then divided by the stride plus one. So it's going to be exactly the same equation applied on the, and images of course are not symmetric. Sometimes images are, you know, horizontally elongated and, and so on, vertically. So that's how you'll find the size of the output, okay? So now we've understood uh, what a convolution is, right? Now let's go back to see how the entire process will work. And let's say we're trying to, we have, we have, we were trying to create a convolutional neural network, which is going to be given two images is going to be given one image which is uh, slanted on the left side, and we're going to give it another image which is like this, okay, slanted on the right side. And now we want to be able to create a convolutional neural network uh, which will be able to predict with a certain probability whether it's left slanted or it's right slanted, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to use these two filters, okay? So we'll, we'll take this, We'll take the output of these, and now we're going to apply, we're going to take both the filters, we're going to apply it to the image, and we're going to look at the output, and that's going to be called the output layer, okay? So this is how it's going to look. Um, make it a little bigger. I hope people can see uh, online as well, okay? So um, let's say we have these two images and we're applying, um, 
we we're going to apply the same filter. So we have we have filter uh, F1, which was the same as earlier, and F2. And these are two examples, two cases. Okay, so the top case and the bottom case. The top case is applying the two filters on image number one, and the bottom case is applying the same filters on image number two. Okay. Uh, what do we get at the output? We've already seen this. So this output is going to be 0 0.5 over here. All right, when you apply filter one, when you apply filter two, it's going to look like this. Okay. When you apply filter one on image number two, it's going to have small numbers. But when you apply filter number two, it's going to have big numbers, which are going to look like this. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the output and we're going to uh, rearrange it, okay? The rearrangement simply means that we want to make it into a vertical line. So what you see over here is you've taken the 0 0.5, you, you're going like this, okay? You to put 0 0.5 first, then you put a zero, then you put a zero, then you put a 0 0.5 over here. So this comes out from the application of filter one, on image one. And then again, the filter two is also put side by side, okay? So we're applying both the filters to the same image at the same time, okay? So what are we going to get? We're going to get zero and then 0 0.25 and then, then 0 0.25 and then zero. 0 0.25, 0.25 and then a zero, okay? So you get this output, G. I've just picked a random image, okay? I'm just taking two examples and all we're trying to do is agar aapke paas do is tarah ki image aati hai, and you're trying to create a neural network, a convolutional neural network, can it predict ke kya ye wali line hai ya ye wali line? That's our whole idea, okay? Where we got the images, I've just put it out of hat, okay? It could be a completely different image and I'll show you other examples as well, okay? So, um, so, now, the, so now we've got this output. This is the output from here till here. This is the rearranged output based on image number one being applied to both the filters F1 and F2. And this is the output that we're getting when we apply image number two on both the inputs F1 and F2, okay? Now, this is, the, this is going to be called the output layer, okay? And uh, the output layer is going to be connected and ima imagine these are all neurons, okay? So this is a convolutional neural network. This is again at heart a neural network, all these inputs are the inputs, these are the X1s, okay? So you've got an input which is a three by three, and then you've got a bunch of filters and we'll see how this actually works out. But this is again, all the neural network. And now you've got a neural network output. And what you're trying to do is create two output, um, Y1 and Y2. And these are going to be able to de determine whether if Y1 has a bigger number, okay? Then it implies that the result is the first type of image, okay? And if this number is bigger than Y1, then it implies that it is the second type of image, okay? So let's see how this will work. Now, through the back propagation algorithm, okay, what's going to happen is that we're going to give it a lot of images which are left slanted. Ultimately, it will do the training and will do the training and it will result in, and this is again a long shot, but I'm telling you what it will do, it, should, it is expected to do, is it will pick out that when these numbers, these numbers over here, so this is, all these are particular locations, okay? These are particular locations in the output layer. And if the first, second, third, if the first and the fourth location have big numbers, it's going to say that let's weight those numbers by a large weight. Okay, remember the weights. So this is your synapse, it's giving it a large weight. So it's going to say that if after all the training, it's going to say that if these two numbers are big, then the output is most likely a left diagonal. Okay. And how did I get this weight to be one? Because of back propagation algorithm. Okay. Um, however, if these two weights are big, okay. Uh, and it's going to give a weight over here of one as well, okay? And if these two are going to be big, then the output is going to be Y2. So, so I'm weighing all of these with ones, 
the rest of them are also con con connected. So these, this is what is referred to as a fully connected output layer. In other words, the output layer, the final outputs are connected to this hidden layer and uh, all of these. So this Y1 is connected to both this, this, this so is going to have all of these inputs. I'm not showing you all these connections, all right? So there's going to be one to eight uh, connections over here. Now, each one of them is going to have a certain weight. And after the neural network is trained, guess where the weights are going to be high? The weights for Y1 are going to be high over here, okay? And when Y2 is connected to all these points, the weights over here are going to be high. Why is that? Because it figured out that when the weights over here are high, after training, it figured out that the image generally is a right leading diagonal. Okay, so that's all there is to it. You know, this is what a convolutional neural network is. That it's able to take uh, filters, okay? It applies it to a particular image and it gets an output layer. And then after training, uh, the output layer has got weights. And so this is, called, this is an example of classification. It's trying to classify between Y1 and Y2, okay? Now you can imagine this could be Y1 could be cats and Y2 could be dogs, right? What would it happen? You would have a lot of dog, cat, let's say Y1 is cats and Y2 are dogs, okay? So what would happen? You would fill, you'd give it a lot of cat images, okay? You'd also give it a lot of dog Im images, okay? Um, every time um, it got a correct result for a cat, you would have, this is the, again, label data, okay? You would have label data, which would say, yes, uh, you got the answer correct, or no, you got the answer wrong. It would calculate the loss. It would go through the back propagation and try to figure out how to improve this. So how would you improve this particular weight over here? Go through the gradient descent, okay? So how are the gradient descent would do? Which would simply calculate the, the standard mechanism of, of calculating the loss, okay? So the gradient descent algorithm used uh, for back propagation will be applied to each one of these weights. And eventually you'll be able to figure out that if you've got enough training of cats and dog images, it will be able to say that the, that the appropriate weights uh, for cat uh, will have the corresponding weights very large and other points will be small, okay? And similarly, uh, you know, so you could have this training for not just two, two categories. You could have, you know, a thousand categories. So one of the famous uh, uh, examples of this is on ImageNet. ImageNet is, uh, I don't know if people have heard of ImageNet, it's a competition, which has been going on, I think, for at least over a decade. It's, uh, I think, organized by um, Berkeley. No, so, sorry, by Stanford. The professor, Dr. Uh, Lili, I think originally Chinese, she has been uh, pioneering this competition since I think 2008 and so on. And it has, um, it ha it's based on um, a, a very large set of images which have been laboriously labeled by them, okay? And it has, uh, I think a thousand categories. And the challenge every year in this competition is who has the best um, neural network we can take all those images that they provide, okay? And we can get the best accuracy. So every year there's a competition. And of course you've got the label data. Now the label data has some inaccuracy. And you might ask why would a human being make an inaccurate, uh, you know, if it's a dog, it's obvious that it's a dog, right? But the reason why there's some inaccuracy is because one of our PhD students actually is quite famous now, I forget his name. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time actually labeling all the images. Okay, now the images were reduced from the original high resolution to make it, you know, workable to a much smaller image. And when you do that, you lose some resolution. So sometimes these are real images. Sometimes it's hard to figure out if it's a cat or a dog. And there are thousands such categories, right? It's, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's a, you know, a train or what have you. So sometimes hard to figure out whether it's, a, it's a, you know, a car or it's a truck. You know, it looks like similar. So there is some inaccuracy. I think there was you know, a few percentage inaccuracy. So as the competition proceeded, uh, when deep neural networks came in and when um, 
uh, Jeffrey Hinton uh, started his backpropagation algorithm, which was his famous contribution from University of Toronto, University of Toronto. So he uh, introduced his algorithm and back in, I think 2012 was the first time when they started getting really good results. And there was a point when actually the results were better than the human predictions. Okay, so that is the amazing part that uh, it, the, the results were accurately, more accurately predicting whether the results are, you know, it's, if it's a cat or a dog or one of the thousands of images. And ima imagine it, it's not an easy challenge to be able to categorize out of a thousand different categories. Okay, so even for a cat, there'll be maybe 10 different categories, you know, types of cats, types of dogs and so on. So eventually, be, uh, because humans have certain limitations and when you're training a neural network, you're training it out of millions of perhaps millions of images. And this has been shown true for you know, other areas as well. So one of my students uh, recently was working on trying to be able to classify images of malarial cells. Okay, whether can you look at an image and to be able to classify if there is uh, malaria, if it's malarial infected or not. Okay, and if you have a large number of images, then doctors can only do as best as they can. You know, you, the doctors have typically seen maybe a thousand images, X-ray images. But if you can train a neural network based on millions of images, then it can ultimately do better than humans. Okay, and so this has been found to have a lot of applications in you know tremendous areas, and and uh, uh, you know. Uh, Medical field is one of the examples that has been uh, applied extremely successfully. G. Right, so this is just one there. So this is an example where you have a very simple neural network and I haven't gone through a lot of the algorithm. So the, this is based on a very simplistic case where you have a filter, a single layer, single input layer, a single hidden layer, uh, the hidden layer basically comprises of a filter and an output, and then the output, okay? The hidden layer consists of a, single, of a set of filters, okay? So now let's take a look at a slightly uh, different case now. There, there, there are two, there are, uh, several aspects now. Let's take a look at uh, what happens when you have large images. So the next thing that you want to do is to, if you have, let's say, a thousand by thousand image, okay? you typically want to make it a little smaller. So one of the techniques that is done uh, is called max pooling. Okay, so here's an example of what max pooling does. Okay, so the idea here of max pooling is that you take a pooling filter. So the idea is somewhat similar, but it's not based on convolution. Okay, the filter is called max pooling because all it does is it takes the maximum value in a particular area. So let's say you have a pooling filter which is two by two. And you have, you use a stride of let's say two. Typically you do use a stride, which is a little, uh, which is maybe the size of the filter, okay? So what are you going to do? You're going to uh, apply the pooling filter. So I've given you the results. I wasn't intending to do that. Let's just calculate it. So uh, let's say we don't have these values here and try to calculate these values. Okay, so um, what are the values going to be? Well, all, all we're going to do is going to apply this filter and we apply it to this particular area, again, as in the past, and we're going to take the maximum value. Okay, so all it's doing is taking the maximum value. So what is the maximum value over here going to be? 0. 0.7, what's the value? And you're going to apply it now, you're using a stride of two. So what's the maximum value over here going to be? 0. 0.2, what's the maximum value over here going to be? 0. 0.5, and it's going to be zero, okay? So this is a very simple technique, and guess what the output size is going to be? W2, again, W1, plus 2P, minus filter size, divided by stride, plus one, okay? So is that right? The, the, the padding is zero in this case. W1 is two minus two, right? That become, sorry, W1 is four. I knew that was going wrong somewhere. So four minus two is two, okay? Divided by two is equal to one, plus one is two. So your output is size is correct, 
directly predicted by, by this. Now, um, if your stride is, if your image size W1, let's say, is 1,000, and your stride is, let's say, 10, the image is going to be reduced by a factor of by a factor of 10, right? So it's going to become, so basically you have some number over here, but roughly this number is going to be about 1,000. So it's going to become approximately about the si one S upon size, okay? So if you pick a stride, a large stride, you can very quickly reduce the size of the output, okay? And the output, and then you're going to apply all the rest of the algorithms on the output. So it's a good way to be able to reduce the size. Now, max pooling has been uh, recently, in the last few years, is being criticized very heavily by Jeffrey Hinton, okay? Uh, not to be confused by Geoff Hinton, uh, who's the guy who will be following at University of Washington, right? So Jeffrey Hinton is one of the gurus um, of neural networks who uh, you know, proposed the backpropagation algorithm and he was of University of Toronto. So Jeffrey Hinton uh, uh, is, has recently been criticizing that max pooling, although it's been working very well, uh, he says that the reason, the, uh, it's, it's, un, it's very unfortunate that max pooling has actually been working very well because it's actually a very bad algorithm, okay? Now, why do you think this is a bad algorithm? Well, what are the pros and cons? So what are the first, what's the advantage of max pooling? Sorry? It reduces the size, right? So you immediately have a much smaller image to work with. Okay, but what is the disadvantage? You, uh, what kind of, uh, what are you losing? By taking the max pooling over here, you've actually lost some of the, some of the actual granularity, right? So you've lost 0.5 over here, the zeros over here, and this may actually have some meaning, right? So if the image, if there was something, some fine points over here, which was reflected by this part of the image, you've actually lost that by taking the maximum value. Now, you might ask, why are we taking the maximum value and why are we not taking the minimum value? You might say, well, let's apply min pooling, right? Or average pooling. So there are algorithms which could perhaps do that, but why do you think we're taking max pooling, G? Very good. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a look at a particular part, portion of the image and we're trying to see which, what is the main uh, feature in that, okay? So if, if this particular feature, let's say, was identifying, you know, this, this filter here was identifying glasses, right? So we want to be able to see that in this particular portion of the image, was a glass found or not? Now, if you did a minimum pooling, what would it say? It, it would say, well, uh, you know, if, even if a glass, uh, you know, somebody wearing glasses was found, it would come down to zero. But if there was one pixel which said, yes, we found somebody, you know, that particular portion seems to have a glass, then you want to be able to pick that. You want to be able to say, yes, that particular person is wearing a glass. So you want to be able to do max pooling so that you can pick out the feature in that particular portion. Now it has another problem. So if you think about, uh, let's say, um, an image, um, okay? So here's an image. Well, my drawing is not gonna be very good. Let's say, here's an image, okay? Now, your, um, your filters are perhaps going to be, we've seen this before, filters actually pick out certain parts of the image, right? So what do you think as, if you have, let's say 10 filters, okay? What do you think each one of those filters after it's been trained up for a long time, each one of those filters may be picking in this image? Separate features. So maybe there's one uh, filter which picks out ears or maybe a left ear, right? Another filter which picks out the right ear because it is able to pick out, you know, ears which are of this pattern. Eyes may be, you know, something like this, something like this. So there may be one filter which is picking out these eyes and another filter which is picking out these eyes, right? Another filter which is uh, symmetric mouth. So uh, one filter which is uh, figuring out the mouth and another filter which is figuring out the nose, okay? Now, here's another image. Okay. 
Okay. Does it have a nose? Yeah, it has a nose. Well, that, that's supposed to be in my drawing. That's supposed to be a nose, okay? This is supposed to be a right ear, okay? This is supposed to be a left ear. This is supposed to be one of the eyes and this is another eye, okay? And here is the mouth, okay? Is this a picture of an image? Would you say this is a human being? No, right? Why? Because it doesn't look like a human being. It may be a, an alien, right, from outer space, but it's certainly not a human being. But guess what the neural network is going to say? It's going to say that, yes, it's going to categorize it as, let's say, why one was a human being, a homo sapiens, is going to say this one by one value is going to be very high. Why is that? Because it, it has all the individual features, okay? So if you look at the output layer, it's going to say, yes, was there an ear? Was there a left ear? Yes. Was there a right ear? Yes. Was there a mouth? Yes. Was there a nose? Yes. And all of these are going to add up to a very high weight. And it's going to say that the, that the image is a human being. Now, uh, Jeffrey Hinton realized this problem, and this is only recent, by the way, so maybe in the last three years, okay? And he said that um, this is why one of the problems with neural networks is that it is not able to have spatial relationship, okay? In other words, it's not able to differentiate between an ear which is looking like this, and an ear which is looking like this, and an ear which is looking like this, right? Now, these two ears are supposed to be symmetric. Now, if the ear is rotated, the filter is going to still catch it because you see, when you're training it, now this is a little bit of complexity, okay? Now, when you're training this image, uh, you're going to be training it on people who are going to be like this. You know, somebody's lying on the side, somebody might be sleeping, somebody might be actually hanging upside down, all right? Uh, you're going to have those images. Now, this image is going to have a mouth which is going to look like this, eyes over here, and ears like this. This guy might be sleeping over here, all right? And his ears are going to look like this, okay? Now, individually, the neural network is going to say, well, this is an ear, right? Sorry, this is an ear. This is also an ear. This is an ear which is upside down, but yes, it is an ear. So the neural network is going to recognize ears in all kinds of angles, right? Uh, but when you put them all together and it says that, well, if the left ear is supposed to be in this diagonal, in this shape, the right ear is also supposed to be symmetric. So the normal neural network in CNN convolutional neural network is not able to do that, okay? And the normal filters break up. And one of the reasons is that the, um, and one of the reasons is that max pooling is the, is the filter to blame. Why do you think is the filter to blame? It's, it's picking up the most prominent feature. So it says if a one is over here, if it's a 0.7 over here, and uh, you know it, it doesn't really look at the position of 0.7 within the image, okay? So it's losing some of the granularity. And that is why, uh, uh, now a better technique, which has only recently been uh, uh, recommended by him, and uh, it's it's not really hasn't really been tested. In fact, one of my I asked one of my PhD students to work on that uh, to see if he can if if he can apply it to some of the existing algorithms. He's working on uh, being able to. Uh, he's working with a U.S.-based company, which actually produces works for you know companies like Tesla and Waymo and so on. And they're trying to be able to have uh, better uh, image captioning, okay? And the existing image captioning is extremely difficult because somebody actually has to label all the data. And labeling, imagine if you have large numbers of, every time you have a, a, you know, a car going down the road, uh, let's say um, a Tesla, it's capturing images at the rate of, you know, let's say 30 images per, per frame, okay? And there are millions of Teslas, I think millions of Teslas on the road. Each one of them is ca capturing, let's say a thousand by thousand image, 30 times a second. Now imagine that somebody, if you want to be able to have all that label data, somebody actually has to go ahead and do that labeling. 
and it costs a fair amount. It's not cheap to actually get a human being to do the labeling. So he's working on this area. And uh, I've asked him to use a particular algorithm to be able to see if we can do better than that. Okay, so this is a research area. G. Okay, no, so you're missing the point. You see what it's trying to do, uh, and this is again a, a slightly more advanced point, unless you actually go through the whole thing, you won't be able to understand it. What it's actually trying to do is find a spatial relationship, okay, between these objects. So it uh, these right now, there is no relationship between these two, okay? This year is an year, and this year is an year, even though they're not symmetric. But, um, by the new algorithm that Jeffrey Hinton has proposed, it's called capsule networks, by the way. Capsule networks. So it's completely different from convolution. It doesn't behave like convolutional networks does. Okay, it's based on a layered concept. It's based on, you know, sort of like an onion ring. One layer feeds, feeds on top of another layer, okay? So what that does is not only does it say that this is an ear, but it also gives it a vector, okay? So it says that this is an ear, but it's actually in a particular direction, okay? So if this ear is in a particular direction and this ear is in a particular direction, it actually captures those vectors as well, the directional vectors. And then it says that a human being does not have ears in which the vectors are in opposite direction. A human being will have both the ears will be in the same direction. Okay, so uh, so capsule networks is able to capture that. Hmm. Okay, so you got a good point. What you're saying is that in the real world, your images will be drawn from real world, so you'll never actually have an example like this. And so why do we need to be able to figure out whether this is a human being or not? That's a good question. G. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. So basically, now we are addressing the advanced point. So over the last decade, I would say that this wasn't an issue, okay. But as you get into more advanced networks and more advanced issues, you have issues. For example, there's something called a pixel attack. Okay, I don't know if you've heard of it. What a pixel attack basically says is that you have an image, okay. You have an image of a human being. Now, a neural network basically works on numbers, okay. It basically it's looking at the output and it's saying that is the value, so here's an output, okay? So let's say that you have, um, let's say this is the output vector and uh, a human being is, let's say these two particular values, if these are high, it means it's a human being, all right? Human, and if these two values are high, it means it is a cat. All right, now what a pixel attack does is that, um, and this is, you know, people who are hackers have been able to figure this out. What they've been able to say, say, show is that you take a picture of a human being, all right? If we take a look at that, we will say it's a human being, all right? You take, uh, you, you feed that into a normal neural, well-trained neural network, it's going to say it's a human being, but, what if you can do is make small changes in individual pixels so small that you can't even actually, the human being can't recognize it. So the human being will say, this is an image, but you've had slight modification in the images such that it results in these values becoming smaller and these values becoming bigger, okay? How they do that, I, I really don't know, but this is an advanced attack, right? somehow they're able to change individual portions of that image 
So the humans see that it is obviously a human being, but the neural network completely gives the wrong prediction. It says, well, this is not a human being. It says it's a cat, okay? And papers have been published in this area which show that uh, using pixel attack, you can completely get the wrong prediction. And why do you think that's useful? Or why do you think that's dangerous? Why do you think pixel attacks, people, you know, hackers are working on pixel attacks? Why is it, why is it important to be able to misdiagnose for some people? So suppose that you're using a camera for security purposes and you're identifying human beings, right? So you're, you're looking at and you, you've got a camera installed outside in IBA and you're looking for human beings, right? And in the middle of the night, if you find somebody walking over there, you want to be able to trigger that image and be able to alert the guard and to say, well, there's a human being walking in the middle of the night, right? Now, if somehow you're able to change that using a pixel attack, and you're able to change that image so that it looks like a cat, right? So the guard is going to say, well, there's a cat in the middle of the night. I'm not going to even bother turning on the, the camera and look for it, right? So that's what's happening in, in such kind of pixel attacks is that you are changing the probability of the outcome. And as a result, you could actually masquerade. So you could use a pixel attack to, you know, in, because you see what happens when you have these tools, right? Um, the problem is that you start getting too reliant on them, okay? And I'll give you a real, real world example. Um, there was a recent video of my, actually my son-in-law uh, works at Ford and he's also in this field, right? So he's always uh, giving examples of uh, where, the, where other companies like Tesla are doing badly, right? So he recently sent me a video of uh, Tesla and Waymo and Tesla generally at odds with each other and other companies like Ford, you know, uh, you know, a lot of companies don't like Tesla simply because the advantage that they have is that they have a large fleet of cars. If you think about the basic difference between let's say Tesla and Waymo, right? These are the two main competitors right now in self-driving cars. So self, uh, Waymo has Google behind it and uh, Tesla has obviously Tesla behind it and Tesla also manufactures cars. Waymo, Google doesn't manufacture its own cars, not in the car business, right? So what do you think are the pros and cons of these two companies? What are the advantages of Tesla? They're both in the neural networks, they're, they're both in self-driving, but Tesla has certain advantages because they've actually got their own fleet of cars, right? They've got a million cars on the road. Waymo doesn't have a million cars, right? It doesn't manufacture cars. It may have a thousand cars, a few hundreds of thousands, a few tens of thousands of cars, which Google has actually deployed on the road. So what do you think is the basic compar comparative point between Waymo and Tesla? Data, exactly. Who has more data? Who has more real world data? Let's put it this way. Tesla has got more real world data because they've actually got their own cars on the road and they're capturing real world data. Who has better algorithms? Algorithms. Now there's a difference between, okay. Uh, what neural networks is basically saying is that um, you know, in the old days, what you used to do is you should take an image and be able to figure out whether it's an image of a cat or a dog, you'd apply fancy algorithms, right? Humans would come up with algorithms and people spent, you know, decades on trying to come up with the best algorithm. Neural networks has changed all of that, right? What has changed? Who's, what, who's figuring out the algorithms now? the data is actually figuring out the algorithms, right? So the data is actually generating the best algorithms, but the architectures are still, humans are still developing the architecture, whether you're going to use a neural network, which is going to have 10 layers, or it's going to have 100 layers, whether it's going to have max pooling layers and so on or not, that's still dependent on human beings, right? So Google, well, well way more with Google behind it, naturally has a lot more programmers, right? as compared to Tesla. So they have better architectures. So they're coming up with better architectures and better algorithms. But the limitation that they have is that they have limited real world data, okay? Waymo on the other hand, doesn't have that large set of you know, developers, but they do have the large set of real world data, okay? So 
the, 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 you know, the competition is on. Who's going to win? It depends, right? The you know, jury is still out. Uh, the chances are for, for Tesla. Yeah, that if, you, if you ask, uh, what's his name? Tesla's, uh, huh? Elon Musk, right? So if you ask Elon, he's going to say Tesla is going to win, definitely. And, and I think there is, uh, but if you ask, you know, the Google chap, he's going to say they're going to win. But the jury is still out. It's still hard to say who's going to win. But the basic difference, again, is that um, what Google has been able to do is to create fictitious data, simulated data, okay? But um, Elon actually believes that simulated data is actually no good, okay? Because he believes that if you are actually relying on simulation, simulated data, and if your simulated data actually is very good in predicting real world data, then you know what he thinks. He has this really uh, weird concept, not overfitting, but he has this concept that perhaps, you know, people, uh, you know, one of the fundamental issues that have been, you know, plagued humanity all, all along is that, you know, you know, people, the philosophers think about where did humans come from? You know, is there a, a God? you know, that created us, or do, is there a multiverse? And, you know, all those theories. So people don't really know where we came from and what's the end. You know, there's a lot of unknown questions. One of the uh, thoughts that Elon actually has is that we are actually part of a simulation, okay? <laughs> he actually thinks that maybe, you know, aliens, some of the aliens have actually created us and we're all just, you know, simulations. So uh, he thinks that if simulated data is extremely accurate in predicting real world data, then that's, um, you know, that's a factor, you know, which is sort of saying that, yes, we are perhaps living in a simulated world, but that's a far-fetched thought, okay? And that way you can predict the, the future as well, right? So, but anyway, that we're going off on a limb, but basically the idea is that um, there is, uh, there's a big issue as to where, whether, simulated data is going to be able to do as well as real data. So if Google is able to get a large number of simulated data, will it actually you know, replace the original data? Okay, but if you ask Elon, he'll still know. Um, so where was I? I was coming to uh, the problems with the, the question that you've asked, which is kind of a, a deep question. So uh, what happens is that people start, when they start relying on data, they start over relying on systems, okay? So what's happened is, and I was giving the example of, of that video, which uh, I'm sure you'll find online as well. In that particular video, what uh, they showed was um, people uh, in Teslas, uh, you know that Tesla has an autopilot mode, right? So you can, so the autopilot, so there's five levels of, um, of self-driving. The level one is supposed to be where you are in complete control and there's a little bit of control given to you. Maybe it can control how far you are or maybe you can just follow another car and so on. And level five is the other extreme where basically the car is in complete control and level three is in between, in between and so on. So Tesla right now, the Tesla, Tesla, what they call an autopilot is somewhere at actually level two, which means that the human being is supposed to be in control, right? And you're not supposed to be uh, you're actually supposed to be uh, driving the car with a little bit of help from the autopilot, right? Now, several major accidents have happened over the last uh, decade, last maybe half a decade, right? You might have some seen some of these. Uh, in some of those examples, what happened was that, you know, uh, there was a sun behind a particular, well, one famous example was where the, the road markings were changed recently and the uh, the autopilot didn't recognize the new new road markings, right? And it followed the old road markings. And I've actually seen this part. Uh, and and there was a divider in the middle. Obviously, a new divider was put in, and the car went straight into the divider. Okay. And guess what happened? It was a head-on collision with the divider. The car blew up into flames. Okay. So that is one of the major accidents which happened a few years ago. Now, why did that happen? Because the person who's supposed to be using self autopilot as a guideline actually relied too much. And I've seen videos in which people have taken videos of 
are people who are driving in Tesla autopilots, and believe it or not, they're actually sleeping. Okay, they're sleeping completely asleep, and people who've gone past them, they've actually taken video clips, and they're showing that. And, and interestingly, most of these people uh, that we saw were actually seem to be Chinese of Chinese origin, and it was said that maybe Chinese are too dependent on American technology, right? So they became over dependent on the aut autopilot, and then you have a lot of these accidents. So the point is that um, if you get too over dependent, then you can have these uh, you know, pixel attacks, which can e easily then uh, you know, masquerade for something else. And then if you're relying on the systems too much, and if, for example, if you're a doctor and you're relying on the image to be able to tell you whether you have malaria or not, or if you have some cancer or not, and so on, then you may, you make, you, if there is some kind of a problem or if, if it's being used for security, you could be completely misdiagnosed. And one of the problems with using AI and machine learning in general is that um, when you go wrong, you make a huge mistake. You, go, you, you make a huge blunder. You know, as I said, a human being, when they look at an image, they won't mis, uh, misidentify a cat for a human being and vice versa, right? But with a small pixel attack, uh, the AI engine will be able to completely misdiagnose, okay? So if you become too reliant, you could have a huge problem. And when you go wrong, you go very wrong, okay? So it, co and, you know, it costs lives. So it's extremely important that as we, as we become more and more dependent on, and we are, you know, today, uh, you may not realize it, but, you know, um, companies, when they see that there's so much accuracy in deep neural networks, they automatically, you know, somebody high at the top level, the CEO who may not be too, who tech, tech savvy, may be making a decision that, okay, great, we can rely on this system, okay? And when you become over-reliant on such systems, you make huge mistakes. When you, 99% of the time, you're okay, okay? But that 1% of the time, when you do make a mistake, you make a very significant mistake and that could cause very severe damage, okay? So it becomes very important in such scenarios, uh, this comes back again, I went on a long uh, issue about this, but it becomes very important to be able to understand that as you're becoming more and more dependent on these, on these neural networks, that you are able to identify such differences, okay? And perhaps as we go further and we explore your concern, we'll be able to identify, and maybe you can identify, where is it that you know, this, is, this is important, okay? And I would encourage you to actually look at um, Jeff Hinton and look at some of his videos where he's been able to identify examples of where the traditional neural network CNN goes very wrong, okay? And why capsule networks are important. If you're interested in doing research in this area, maybe that's an area of, you know, of, of pos possible areas of research, okay? Not a lot of work has been done on capsule networks simply because it's so new and it requires, again, a lot of effort to be able to come up with a complete architecture, okay? Uh, so we've, we've come to the end of our session today. Um, I wasn't able to cover as much as I was hoping for, but I think some of these issues, uh, the, uh, the theoretical or the applied nature of neural networks is also important to discuss, okay? So let's stop over here. We'll continue on with uh, examples of ImageNet and examples of uh, CNN in the next lecture. G. जी राइट राइट नो नो सो दिस इज समथिंग दैट आई विल कवर नेक्स्ट टाइम इज दैट एज यू ट्रेनिंग इफ यू ट्रेनिंग इट ऑन ह्यूमन डेटा ओके And if you have a deep neural network, what you'll slowly start to seeing is that the, the, the filters will actually, you'll be able to recognize the filters, just like we saw on the uh, playground, uh, on the neural network uh, tensor playground, you saw that the filters were actually taking the shape of the images, okay? So I'll give you, show you examples as well, that the filters, you can actually see the filters. Some of the filters, will, if you're training it on humans, some of the filters will look like faces, okay? Some of the filters, way at a, depending on which layer you're looking at, if you're looking at very early on in the deep neural network, 
you look at basically images which are straight lines, perhaps, right? It's basically being able to cut, figure out the, the edges in your face. As you go deeper into it, you'll be able to see that it's being able to pick out a complete organ, right? A complete mouth or a complete nose, a complete ear and so on. And as you go deeper into the neural network, you'll see that it's able to pick out different types of images. So it might be able to pick out an image, a filter could be actually depicting an, an image of a person with glasses. Another filter may actually be looking like a person with a beard and so on. So you could use, uh, you know, the traditional, you know, so the, so the non-linearity is built in. You have to use a non-linear uh, activation there, right? Yes, yes, all of that is absolutely applicable, okay? So as you go into the details of the neural network, you'll see that it has, um, no, it has three layers. It has the convolution layer, then it has the max pooling layer, and then it has a non-linear layer, okay, which I wasn't able to get into today. Exactly. So if you're training around human data, eventually you'll be able to see that the filters are, are looking at different types of human beings, human faces. If you're training around birds, for example, you'll see that the filters are capturing different types of the of parts of the birds. You might see some which are looking at the feet. There might be others of the neck. Absolutely anything. As I said, it can, in ImageNet is being trained on a thousand different categories, right? I hope so, I hope so, yeah. Okay, all right, any any questions from those online? Ajit. Yeah, so the average pooling will have trade-offs, right? So you could implement an algorithm and try to see um, what, how does average pooling work, okay? So the average pooling, uh, the objective of the max pooling was to be able to pick out a particular filter, a partic particular feature, right? If you're doing an average, you're saying, yes, maybe there's an ear over there, maybe there's not. Maybe there's somebody wearing glasses, maybe there's not. So the averaging in practice has not been found to be very useful, okay? So this is the result of actual real world experience. People have tried everything, believe me. There are thousands of different architectures over the last decade of applying different things. You know, PhD students all over the world have been trying to come up with different architectures. All the, uh, you know, the AI gurus and all these major companies are, are always trying out different algorithms. So it doesn't, you know, a lot of times it's actually a black box. And that's one of the biggest uh, drawbacks of neural networks is that you don't really know um, why a particular architecture is working so well. Okay, you have some idea but you don't know the why, okay? In traditional algorithms, you could say, well, here's an algorithm which can pick out a particular image, okay? And it's based on, you know, these concepts. But in a neural network, because the, uh, the, the data is creating the algorithm, we don't really know what it really, it, what, what, why it's picking out certain things. So for example, um, we human beings, when we detect it, when we look at an image, we can say, well, it's a cat because it has a tail and has ears, right? But we may not be able to pick out certain subtle feature differences between a cat and a dog. But a neural network, if you train it, train it on enough images, it may actually do better than the, hum than the human being because it, has, it is seeing certain subtle differences which humans didn't even know, okay? And you'll see when this is applied to a lot of, uh, for example, in, um, in certain areas uh, where, which is called reinforcement learning, where game, you know, games are being played, where they found out that, you know, uh, you know, it's far surpassed, you know, the human level. In fact, they figured, you know, neural networks are able to figure out certain aspects of the game which weren't even known to most people, okay? It was built in, but it wasn't known. So um, yes, uh, I, I don't know, I forgot what your original question was. Yeah, so, so, so the thing is that um, average pooling may work in certain areas, right? So it depends on, you know, you can try it out and maybe, you know, tomorrow you might figure out that average pooling is actually working very good, okay? 
But again, as I said, um, neural networks, you, you, a lot of times you don't really know why it's working so well, okay? And that's one of the drawbacks as well. Okay. So it's a good area to explore for research. You can, you can come up with a new algorithm, new architecture, and maybe you'll get good results, but maybe not. 